Good evening, and welcome again. So most of you have welcome this morning already, but welcome, triple welcome to those who have joined us now. Um, I'm Gordula of Sussex. I convene Jaga Studies here at the Institute. Um, and uh, we are, so we, we are, for a couple of days, we are running a conference here on uh, translingual writing. But this evening's um, event uh, is part of a series that I've been running for uh, a few years now with Nottingham University. And uh, what we're doing is we're inviting writers and uh, translators um, to talk, first of all, quite generally about their books and the process of writing, the process of collaboration, where it occurs. Um, but then also really to get into the nitty-gritty of it and to, to look at the texts themselves. So uh, this is what you're in for. Um, and, <laughs> uh, and I am really, really pleased to be able to welcome uh, Katja Potskaya and Shelley Frisch. Um, and uh, I will start by just giving a very quick introduction. I think most of you know, uh, uh, know uh, these writers anyway. But quick introduction and then we'll launch into questions and into the texts. So uh, if I sit down, am I still? You can still hear me. Okay. Yes. So um, Katya Petrovskaya was born in Kiev, uh, later lived in Moscow as well, and grew up speaking Russian. That's what's of interest to, to us here as translingual uh, um, researchers. She started learning German quite late in life. Uh, too late. Too late. <laughs> uh, in her mid twenties, and uh, then moved to Germany. And now we've been living in Berlin for quite a while. Yeah, yeah. So it's not an excuse anymore. <laughs> Um, uh, Katja has been writing first for Russian papers, then for German uh, newspapers. But this project, or the idea of the Silas Esther book, um, has been on her mind for a long time. And uh, she submitted um, a, a, sh a short extract or a short text, um, which is now one of the central episodes, one of the central stories of the uh, of the finished book. She submitted this for, uh, to the jury for the Bachmann Prize. Now, uh, the Bachmann Prize is one of the most pre prestigious prizes in, uh, in Germany. I didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and, and she promptly won it. Um, and uh, it, is, it is now really something like the heart piece of the book, uh, and it deals with um, uh, Katja's great-grandmother's death in, uh, in Ukraine, in Kiev. Um, in 2014, so one year after winning the, uh, uh, the Bachmann Prize for this extract, the whole book was published, Vielleicht Esther, um, and uh, it, it received a lot of attention straight away uh, because although there is a lot of um, publication at the moment in Germany about uh, you know, people looking for um, stories of their ancestors. There's quite a lot of that, but this voice was really original, really different, uh, and the engagement uh, with the quest itself of finding out about family history, um, the, the treatment of remembrance, and, and of course the hugely original handling of language really made it stand out. So uh, after the Bachmann Prize, other prizes followed. The Schubert Prize and Stoller Prize, Aspect Literatur Prize, Strega European Prize. Oh, so <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's been translated into something like 20 languages? Yes, yes. Um, and uh, Shelley Frisch uh, um, produced the English translation, or the American translation, should I say, uh, for Harper Collins in uh, 2018. So I now move seamlessly over to Shelley. Uh, Shelley has been working as a translator and writer for almost 25 years. Uh, before that, she was in academia in German studies uh, at various uh, US universities. Um, her translations are mainly in the area of history and cultural history. 
um, and they are geared towards an academic audience, but also beyond. Uh, I think they're actually mostly for general right. leadership. Most are in fact biographies. Right. Yes. Yes. There's a whole. Um, there's a, a run of, of three books on Kafka, Rainer Stach's three Kafka books. Uh, she translated 2005, 2013, and 2016. Um, and um, uh, but then also a completely different register. I think a translation also of letters. Um, this is due to come out very soon. Uh, the last letters, the prison correspondence between Helmut and Freya von Moltke. That's really quite. <laughs> um, so Shelley is not only a translator, but she's also been teaching translation. She's been running more, more workshops on translation. She's been publishing on um, the translation process. Um, and she has also won many prizes. I'll just mention two here. Two, uh, in 2010, she won the Independent Publishers Book Award Gold Medal for the translation of um, uh, a book uh, entitled Fromm's, How Julius Fromm's Condom Empire Fell to the Nazis. Ask me anything that <laughs> <laughs> uh, And then in 2014, the Helen and Court Wolf Translators Prize. And now for both of them, and that I think is really exciting, for both publications, for both authors, uh, they were shortlisted for the Women in Translation, the Warwick Prize. Um, uh, and currently they are also both uh, shortlisted for the Pushkin House Russian Book Prize, which celebrates the best books that are the Russian speaking world. The Russian speaking world. The Russian speaking world. That's how I get it. So it's possible to speak. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> Um, I, I will not, I think we should not assume anything. I know many of you have read the book, or possibly even both books, um, uh, the, the original and the translation. <laughs> <laughs> but we are not going to assume anything. So I, I would just like to start by giving Katya the opportunity to tell us what the book is about. Uh, <laughs> I know, this is a very good <laughs> No, this book is absolutely not about. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so, therefore, I don't know how to start because, you know, I think that uh, one of the mistakes uh, in uh, uh, English edition that it's called, um, um, it was called memoir, and it's not a memoir, uh, there is a genre uh, description. Unfortunately, there is a genre description because I didn't need it. Mm -hmm. But you know that uh, the editors know this, so they have to put the, uh, the book on a certain shelf, so um, I've been asked to, to explain is it a novel or whatever. So, um, and in German uh, it has a subtitle Geschichten, which is uh, like at the same time the stories and the histories. So, and uh, it's very important because it's not a novel, although there are uh, many books written already in the 20th, uh, uh, 30s uh, in the 20th century, which are less novel than that, mm -hmm. um, but um, I really didn't want to, to pretend to, to write a certain linear narrative or uh, to have the certain I or ich in the text, which is like, similar to, uh, to ich in the next story. So, uh, uh, that, that is actually, it, it, maybe this book, <laughs> forget this word, uh, um, it's hard to say what is it about because uh, because family it's only part of the material. It's more it, it was a sort of necessity to understand what I'm doing in you know like chapters and what I'm doing here. So uh, so it's more like uh, uh, working around this question mm -hmm. and uh, so it's not about past. It's not about family. It's about uh, uh, certain more than more than more than uh, uh, person living in Berlin, uh, stumbling over the history, and uh, and actually that's exactly the question: what uh, what is this history? And uh, the family in this perspective is only the uh, Sprobusk. Sprobusk. 
Well, I don't know. Uh, uh, the law needs um, permission yeah. to enter the site. Mm -hmm. you know? and, uh, um, and actually, it's more about this kind of uh, European landscape where we are moving. Mm -hmm. uh, we are just inside, and uh, all these um, historical catastrophes are existing simultaneously in a way. Uh, at least uh, when I think, in the, actually, in the perception of history. It's something which is absolutely un un unprecedented in my country. Uh, so, uh, so it's more about like, one person in this European landscape, and uh, this landscape is actually a concept of history. Mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah. Yeah. No, no, I, I think that's opening the door. Yeah, yeah, the, and, uh, in this perspective, the language. And um, it was actually, yeah, I, I, I talked about that many times. Uh, you know, it was not the idea, it was a sort of intuitive uh, search, which is now explained as a sort of concept. Mm -hmm. It was not some concept, I mean, any concept actually. Or I just cannot, <laughs> cannot serve them in a way in so, uh, actually, I was looking for something uh, which can suit this uh, uh, kind of uh, idea to talk about things which, about which you cannot really talk. So, in a way, this... Um, so, the muteness. Muteness. Uh, yeah. So, actually, this muteness, uh, how to talk about that out of muteness. Uh, so, uh, how to talk about nonsense. Uh, so the first step is just to lose a lot of time. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so it's not like, you know, there are many people who are talking like it's easier to, work, uh, to write in German. Uh, it's like more... Uh, this and that. <laughs> it's not that emotional, which is really incredible. Uh, uh, <laughs> German not that emotional. Uh, um, but um, I think it was more like a really Russian, there is a term for in this Baldies, yeah, um, in, um, uh, for people who are dealing with architecture, and constructions, uh, and materials. Uh, there is a term, Sotrizblenia uh, material, for instance. So it's uh, resistant of material. So, Sopramat. <coughs> So I really felt that I have to find something which is even more difficult so, uh, to, to write. Uh, uh, it means to write in German was actually much more difficult than to write in Russian because it was like against this kind of routine, uh, this kind of talk talkativeness which, uh, which I had. Uh, yeah. So I uh, try to keep silence. But, but, but doing that, did that then open up the way to see things differently or to, um, you know, to overcome difficulties and to come to points which you wouldn't have come to writing in your own language? I really don't know. Because, um, I think both languages, actually languages are always corrupted. Mm -hmm. Or uh, languages are always innocent. You know, uh, so I mean, it's enough to, 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 to listen to one um, Program of news to really to get really pleasant. Mm -hmm. So uh, and uh, there is a concept of this German language, which is like uh, barking, uh, uh, rough uh, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> Nazi stuff. Uh, so, uh, but everybody forgets that actually Russian language of uh, 20th century is also not only not the strong. So and uh, so growing up in uh, in Soviet Union uh, was really a very very obvious thing, a very obvious experience to to resist this kind of uh, ideologized and very approximate and very yeah it's it's not only Russian English mm -hmm. and even Russian English it's not it's not. so um, mm -hmm. what's the question. The question was whether um, overcoming the difficulties 
then opened up the way to seeing things differently. Yeah, but it was anyway uh, in between two languages all the time. And so I, even in the episodes we were with passage we would read, I suddenly saw the Russian mm -hmm. poem, you know, I didn't mm -hmm. notice that before. And uh, uh, so it's um, it's an interesting question, but anyway it was the search between uh, two more or less corrupted and very beautiful languages uh, for innocence of uh, German language. So innocence only for me, it doesn't mean that I uh, just can uh, share this experience, but uh, I wanted to, uh, to make uh, it innocent for me. And anyway, this feeling that both languages are in a way uh, a sort of uh, Minefield, mm -hmm. Minefield uh, was very, very strong. Mm -hmm. it, it is really astonishing, isn't it? Uh, I mean, you know, in the context of German Jewish writing, there are so many authors who will do anything but, you know, who have real difficulty with writing in the German language. And to hear it described as innocent is, is just very, very surprising. It's it, it all, it's all to do with relativity, isn't it? It's where you come from and, and yeah, to but what it's all, it, it was all to do with the simple fact that uh, there were people who uh, uh, left the uh, German language out of certain reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, I don't have more right uh, for anything just because my relatives perished. Mm -hmm. you know? And in a way, it means that uh, I don't have any right for this kind of uh, uh, racism. Mm -hmm. So for me, it was important to, with this uh, kind of writing, to uh, to say that people who are born now or thrown into life, <laughs> let's use these existential things, uh, um, they're just thrown into their families. and. Uh, a um, German person of my age is exactly that innocent as I. I mean, uh, I could have been German. Uh, so what <laughs> the hell? Yeah. So just, it's something very, very strange and very automatical what was going on. But, but the result really is that it is a very, very fresh approach to, uh, to <coughs> language and therefore also a fresh approach to the topic. I'm, I'm Basically, uh, just uh, the last, yeah. the last, you know, uh, I think it has also something to do with the Russian literature or Russian uh, uh, history. It didn't have this kind of medieval ages as German had, so I, I really felt like I was envious that they had all these knights who fought for their beautiful ladies, um, even married ones. And so I really had this kind of, uh, so for me it was about German is also a language of this kind yes. of literature and also of Wanderungen. So this kind of person who is going, you know, like Ludwig Tieck or mm -hmm. something like that. So people who are just uh, mm -hmm. uh, looking for uh, beauty somewhere. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and in Russian literature it's only religious literature which has this kind of, so it's, it's very German. It's a certain openness, isn't it, that you're uh, uh, allowed to so, so, I, I go away. So, yeah, <laughs> no, but, but the question is, you know, knowing this and, you know, this, this idea of freshness, of openness, of new approach, how do you translate that? Mm -hmm. um, let me start by saying a couple of things about my own yeah. background that feed into that, because there are parallels in my own life. Um, I grew up in Queens, New York, um, sorry to say, the same borough as our current president. I hope for not very much longer. Um, and um, uh, I was born just a few years after the end of World War II. It was a very anti-German um, community. Uh, people wouldn't drive in a Volkswagen or drink German wine or anything like that. Um, and um, the way I started with German, my father was a refugee. Uh, a Jewish refugee from uh, um and his family scattered in all directions. Um, and um, when I was entering junior high school, we had to choose between French, Spanish, and German. I didn't hear very much German as a child. I heard a great deal of Yiddish, which is similar. Um, and um, I chose French. Um, well, <laughs> it turned out that nobody wanted to take the German class. 
um, and uh, anybody, whose parents <laughs> anybody whose parents didn't object in writing got placed in the German class. <laughs> That's how I started. Um, and uh, next thing I knew, I'm fast forwarding a lot here, I was holding a PhD in German. <laughs> um, and, uh, and here I am, sitting in before you, uh, speaking about German literature, among other things. Um, I don't know if your literature is German literature, really, but, um, but that, that is something that I've worked on for so many years. Um, another thing that's very recent in my background is that um, the French branch of my family, um, my uncle, uh, who used to be called uh, Moritz, now Maurice, um, uh, everybody changed their names as they went to different countries, um, and uh, he's no longer alive, but I have some cousins who are now in their 80s. Um, uh, they're, this is the Frisch branch of the family. Um, and uh, our uh, Israeli branch of the family doesn't use the C before the H, so it's taken all, all kinds of permutations. Um, the French branch of the family is now trying, in a way that eerily mirrors your book, um, to gather letters, um, whatever they can find, in various languages. Some are in uh, German, some are in Yiddish, some are in um, very Slavic languages, um, and, and, and have these translated from the various languages so that we can piece together our family history. So I'm in the process of learning about my family history and was uh, while I was translating this book. So um, it, it certainly resonated for me. Um, all translation grapples with many of the things that you were dealing with in writing in a language not your own. Um, so as I was translating this book, um, and as I'm translating, in fact, any book, um, I'm looking at, um, people always say, oh, you must be good at German if you translate from German. I say, oh no, the German book is already finished. I have to write a book in English. Um, because you're looking at German and you're typing English all the time. So there's a fundamental disconnect that's not, I think, dissimilar to what Katya was saying about her bilingual sort of in betweenness. Um, and often I find myself, you know, it looks really um, sort of snobby, but it is when it comes up and, oh, I can't really think of that expression in English, or how do you say, aus dem Stegreif, you know? Um, but you really are in between, and I find myself, while I'm at my desk, um, not knowing the simple, you, you must hear that, even though I don't speak the exact English that's spoken here in London, uh, to put it mildly, um, <laughs> Uh, it is my native language, and yet I find myself suddenly not knowing prepositions in English, not knowing the simplest expressions. I have to move away from the German and regain that language. So the grappling for language, I find, is in, is in many ways a, a similar and maybe weirdly similar process. Um, so in, in approaching this text, which um, also, as, as I'm sure you've noticed if you read the book, contains not only German, but um, a panoply of uh, language. Um, I had to make those differences in language come out in different ways, particularly where there was English. For example, um, if Katya wrote um, Only You, and she wrote that in English, um, she was calling up um, Elvis Presley, and I didn't know that until she told me that. Um, because only you is, is not a particularly, uh, uh, it doesn't jump out at you in English. Um, and um, and uh, I think play it, you said, was, was from uh, play it again. So, play it again. Play it again. And so, so um, you know, how to handle, uh, I find in many of my translations, um, many of my translations are in fact filled with, uh, with English and those are the hardest words yeah. to translate, the hardest phrases, the hardest words because they resonate so differently and I need to make them jump out in the way that they did in German. Um, when I was translating Rainer Stock's 2,000 uh, page biography of Kafka, um, you know, he would write things like, uh, das war ein Schock for nothing. What in the world does that mean? Um, turns out it was billiards expression and I wasn't aware of that. Um, and I, I handled it another way because um, I thought that a reader of a Kafka biography in English um, might not, but might be more puzzled than enlightened by some of those <coughs> metaphors. Um, so we talked about that um, and, um, 
and, and he was fine for my, it, when he used expressions about ricocheting across a, a billiards board, um, I used very different language that talked about going from word to world, because that's in fact what Kafka was grappling with. He wrote um, one of his novels first in uh, the first few chapters in the uh, first person, and then he decided to distance himself, write it in the third person, um, and he, because he, he was wary of his jump from one to world. Um, and to my way of reading the text, when you translate the text, it's your reading of it. You know, it's, uh, you, you have no perspective, often, other than your own. Um, and, um, and so I uh, used some other wording, and we talked about it, and um, it, it, he was fine with it, and we, we were that way. So um, it, this was a very, very exciting challenge for me, because uh, it's a hard time to translate, <laughs> and, uh, which is good. And, um, and, and so I had some very interesting um, what uh, is often called in German um, aha moments um, of you know when it does come together when it hits you don't know if your readers will ever notice it but it's it's so wonderful to get things right when they work um, which they sometimes do and other times don't. Mm -hmm. So, so we jump right into uh, the the, um, you know, the 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 choice of words the um, uh, the way uh, to translate it, um, how to translate things how to deal with. with between, being between languages. So I think we're steering towards our first passage. I would very much like to, to, uh, to do that first. Um, so what we're going to do is, uh, Katja's going to read in uh, German. At the same time, you will be able to see Shirley's translation up here. So you have to work on two tracks. <laughs> Just <laughs> like me, I don't. And then we'll do, we will change things around. So you are really familiar with uh, the text and the translation, and we can then talk about that text. Katya, would you like to introduce that passage a little bit? <laughs> it's from the chapter uh, about Warsaw or about the trips to Poland, uh, where my family was from. Uh, but it's not actually. As I said, about my family. Um, uh, so I was standing in the middle of uh, Warsaw looking for my Jewish, uh, Jewish relatives, uh, uh, thinking in, in, in Russian, uh, writing in German. So I was like a uh, representative of two occupation colors uh, and at the same time looking for victims. So I was really, it was really, so actually, uh, that's, that's exactly what was uh, part of my interest in many things. But sometimes uh, it was beyond of uh, description. Uh, for example, I spent, so the, the, the chapters in the book goes like that. So uh, they, some of them are too hot, <laughs> and then it has to become uh, a bit uh, colder because it's impossible to emotionally to cope with some uh, topics. And um, this is from the chapter um, um, about um, uh, which comes after, after um, uh, walking in, uh, in the site of the former ghetto in the Mosul. And I'm going to uh, to uh, modern art museum um, finding the pictures and uh, videos of very famous uh, video artist, Polish video artist, uh, Katarzyna Kuzira. Katarzyna is the captain. And Kuzira, it's again this kind of thing, you know, uh, it's, uh, I think very difficult to translate because Kuzi in, in Russian is Trumpha. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes. So, uh, yeah. uh, so it's, it's like you're always, it, it's part of the topic in the book that uh, you are finding only losses and everybody uh, tells you you have a gluck. Yeah, you, you are your yeah. yeah. So this Kozira is also part of the story. So it means that I was working through um, former ghetto and I got so cold and then I went to this museum and I really almost lost my because uh, uh, there were scenes in videos of this Katarzyna Kuzira who was pretending to be a man walking around uh, almost naked in, in the towels and then 
she was losing calls and showing her pennies. So it was like they were sitting there after this get to walk. <laughs> so, um, I well, we have some superimposed. Ah, okay. In the night, I didn't sleep. I dreamed of the sauna, from ghetto, from nacktem and carbon, gekrümmt in Tote oder in Genuss. I dreamed of other sein, Männer and Frauen gemischt. I had a fever. I erzählte Katarina, dass auch ich Katarina heiße. Sie sagte, ich könnte auch Polen sein, sagte ich ihr, denn ohne wie. Wie kalt ist es hier? Ich muss gar nicht spielen. Ich könnte jeder sein, aber doch besser nicht. Nie würde ich es tun. Nein, lieber nichts tun. Ich habe mich auch unter anderen versteckt. Oder nein, eher zur Schau gestellt. Also das ist ein Delirium. Ich muss jetzt so gewohnt. Schau, ich habe nichts Schauer gesagt. Du hast Schauer gesagt. Du oder ich. Entweder ohne. Ich weiß nicht, ob ich jemals unter den Meinigen war und wer sind die Meinigen, diese Ruinen um uns herum und in uns und die Sprachwechsel, die ich unternehme, um beide Seiten zu bewohnen. Ich und nicht ich zugleich zu erleben. Was für ein Anspruch. Ich bin anders. Aber ich verstecke mich nicht warm und sonst bin ich schon schau, schau, kalt. Wieder ganz kalt, aber ich kann so tun und ich und ich und ich, was für ein seltsames Wort, wie Ort, was für ein Ort, als ob ich zu jemandem gehört, zu einer Familie, zu einer Sprache, und manchmal sieht es sogar so aus, als wäre es zu mir. Ich kann mich nicht verstecken und das alles auf Deutsch, diese Sprache, mein angeklebtes Geschlecht. Auf Deutsch ist die Sprache weiblich und auf Russisch ist sie männlich. Was habe ich mit diesem Wechsel getan? Ich kann mir das angeben, wie du quatschen. Ich kann mich auf den Tisch stellen und das demonstrieren. Schaut alle, ich habe es hier unten vor mein Deutsch. Ich schwitze mit meiner auf die Zunge geprägten deutschen Sprache. But it's strange if it's not in the normal text, you know, because it's, it's something. Uh, you know. And you'll notice it's all lowercase, uh, that already uh, sets it off visually. At night, I couldn't sleep. I dreamed of the sauna, of the ghetto, of naked bodies contorted in death or in pleasure. I dreamed of difference, men and women, mix. I had a fever. I told Katarzyna that my name is also Katarina. I quivered. I could also be a Pole, I said to her, la double vie. How cold it is here, no acting needed. I could be anyone, but better not. Never would I do it, no, better do nothing. I have also hidden away among others, or no, it's more like showing off, show. I didn't say show up, you said show up. You or I, either or. I don't know whether I was ever among my own, or who are they, my own? These ruins around us and within us, and the change of language I'm undertaking to inhabit both sides to experience I and not I at the same time. What a thing to aspire to. I am different, but I'm not hiding, warm, and otherwise I'm shy, show, show up, cold, quite cold all over again, but I can play the part, and I and I and I. What a strange phrase. Sounds like phase. What kind of phase? As though I belong to someone, to a family, to a language, and sometimes it even looks as though that's the case, I can't hide, and it's all in German, this language, my tacked on gender. In German, the word language is feminine, and in Russian it's masculine. What did I do with the switch? I can tack it onto myself, like you, Katarzyna. I can get up onto the table and demonstrate it. Look, everyone, I've got it. Down here, oh, my German. I'm sweating with my German language tacked onto my tongue. thing that really struck me was how you are, uh, to a certain extent, uh, moving the idea of belonging from something that is attached to place mm -hmm. 
to something that is attached to time mm -hmm. by choosing the, you know, moving the um, vault, or clinked the odd, you will be made into a phrase, phrase, some phrase, phrase. 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 Yes. Uh -huh. Well, um, it, seem, it seems to me often in this book, and, um, and often in many books, uh, you, uh, translators look along the spectrum of medium and message and try to figure out what in any given instance um, is, is key. Um, and I think very often in this book, um, the spectrum tilts toward uh, medium. Uh, that the language has to sound a certain way, which I was delighted by because I'm a very acoustic translator anyway. And it seemed to me that the fact that these words rhymed uh, in, in German uh, needed to emerge in some way. And, um, and so um, instead of Walt and Ort, um, I went a different way uh, semantically in order to capture the acoustic uh, qualities of this, of this phrase. And, um, you know, you always say to yourself, um, hope it works. <laughs> so I hope it works for you. It, it, it makes it different, but it works. But, you know, I mean, there are a whole bunch of things that yeah, I could point out in this paragraph yes. that um, are really very different in the, in the, in the German. Um, and I, I don't know if you want to go into all of those, but for example, um, in the quite cold all over again, um, yours was more temporal and all over again can also mean that you were cold from head to toe. And so it, had, it takes on a more physical sense, uh, which in the song I thought was, was quite a lucky moment. Um, we often hear the phrase, um, lost in translation. Every once in a while you get that um, inkling of a maybe also found yeah. in translation. It's a Russian way uh, to find something and to find yourself or to find something when another person always uh, used to say uh, it's cold and now it means you are uh, far from, the, from this uh, hidden uh, uh, object and uh, when you are moving closer uh, is it, uh, Right, they say that in children's games too. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. This, yeah, and there is um, another thing, for example, in German and um, this word is uh, very uh, very important, but uh, it's also a German word which is so marked, and it's tun. Because tun, uh, um, uh, from tun derives uh, theta, and it's like to do something and uh, uh, perpetrate. And that's the problem in English that we have two yeah. different language families working against each other, fancy words and romance words are perpetrated. Exactly. Um, and then you have plain spoken words which are dramatic. So uh, if you are using uh, tune in German, so the whole passage with this uh, uh, I, I don't want to do anything uh, has the meaning if you're not doing anything, you're not perpetrating. So uh, it's almost impossible to create the same line in, in, um, uh, in English. So uh, Shelley was looking for other ways to, um, to create new lines to uh, yeah, I mean, the translation, you really don't want to stay on the level of word for word, or sometimes even sentence for sentence, but you want in larger units, you want to go for something that, um, that has, um, that, that carries along the same spirit, and sometimes different wording gets you to the place that recreates um, the resonance of the text to your new readership, and, um, and so, I try to be as sensitive to that as possible and use phrases that um, might give a new readership mm -hmm. a sense of um, what's going on with the words, mm -hmm. how the words are playing with each other and interacting with each other. Exactly. Sometimes that seems more like, like a chapel of my tongue. So there are, there are many places where these alliterations uh, are lost and they are created in some other places. So I'm, I'm a Actually, we both are um, very fond of alliteration, and um, we didn't always get it in the same place. Yes, um, but I loved. Um, you, you may have heard that I, I emphasized that a little bit when I read yeah. last night. Uh, last line because I wanted all those um, those dentals um, to to come through and, and really in a, in a very staccato kind of way tacked onto my tongue. Um, 
And uh, of course, where I grew up in, in Queens, um, we would um, dance and lies our T's and D's. <laughs> I've, I've trained myself for many years not to speak like a New Yorker, um, but it comes through. Uh, still, I'm very um, fascinated by dental dentals, and, uh, and I try to sneak them in. Uh, and this one worked. This idea of um, you know, trying to really get the concept, not concepts, you don't like concepts, but the ideas uh, across yeah. rather than the word for word. Or the, or the feelings. Um, the feelings. Yeah, or the feelings. Um, so you wouldn't mind, you, how do you feel about that if your text were to be changed in order to convey the essence of it, but not the words? You wouldn't mind that. Yeah, yeah but uh, uh, I. <laughs> Uh, fortunately, I don't know that many languages. <laughs> uh, no, but it's really a hard thing because uh, language for this book was so important that actually I, I had to write this book in all languages I don't know or <laughs> I know a little bit so because it's uh, writing out of these restrictions. Uh, so um, also in German I was, uh, uh, yeah, looking for words. But, uh, but the point is that uh, and, uh, what is hidden, uh, but actually this book uh, is already a sort of uh, uh, lost in translation. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it has to be written in, in Russian, but the original doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. So but all the time I recognize something I was not really conscious about. Like, in this passage, there is I, I, I. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I know there is. It's mm -hmm. a verse uh, of Vladislav uh, Kadesevich, I am a very difficult word, I am a very difficult word. So it's like uh, all the time something uh, there rhythmically from Russian yes. poems. Yes. Also, and uh, um, I had a small seminar with uh, translators of my book. It was really uh, an extreme fun because uh, my German. Uh, in this group was uh, uh, the worst. <laughs> no, which is not difficult because there are people who started German who, or bilingual or whatever. And it was really an um, interesting experience. Uh, ah, yeah, and I was always telling, you know, it's a Russian poem and uh, here I mean this and that. And uh, one translator that said, uh, <laughs> so, uh, of course, they are different, they are really, really different, um, different uh, concepts of translating, and uh, uh, some people trying to, you know, to create an image and not to. But it's really interesting because one thing we were talking about earlier was um, that it's not about the words so much, but about syntax very often. You know, it's about syntax, it's about rhythm, and that seems to be, you know, if, if it's the, the, the syntax that is in your head because of this Russian poem, then that train translates into the way you write the German. Of course, for it means it's first thing. Yes. <coughs> and and um, for English language readers, and even uh, for American language uh, readers, maybe even more strongly, um, the syntactical patterns, these, these very, very long sentences, um, hit you in a different way. Uh, German, of course, is famous for very long sentences, and comma splices um, seem even more important to American writers than to British writers, and not not very important at all to German writers. Um, the, the sheer number of comma splices here, um, independence clauses, independent thoughts, strung together with commas rather than um, periods or the dreaded semicolon, um, I'm a real fan of semicolons, but we, that's a subject for another day. Yes, <laughs> that's a subject for another day. We may, uh, unless we want to stay the duel right here and now. Yeah. Um, so, um, you know, the idea of, of trying to make this work, and of course, the fact that this is in lowercase mm -hmm. all the way through, you know, it all of a sudden turns into E. Cummings' look, um, allows for that. It opens the door to that without. Uh, that instant reaction of what's going on here because um, it, this signals um, lyricism that allows you to tug at the images of what the English language allows. And it's very nice to have that, that extra little wiggle room for it. Well, absolutely. I mean, that's what it, 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 you have the freedom and then you have the freedom again, don't you? Yes. Right. Um, the, in, in the U.S., a um, 
recently deceased um, translator Gregory Rabasa, who translated from Spanish. Um, he translated uh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez's 100 Years of Solitude and many other things. And he wrote, somewhat controver very controversially, he said that translation is actually the purest of all writing because things like the plot and, and, and the chapters and everything, that's already done. Yeah. You yeah. can just write your heart out. Um, we, we can maybe talk about that in one of the part five, but I'll just put that out there. <laughs> Um, I will let you move on to uh, 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 another um, area, um, uh, wordplay, because there's, there's a lot of play with words and it relates to this idea of freedom with, with, with the language, especially with a new language, which you stand outside of, so you see a lot more of it, because it isn't so loaded with meaning, you see more the sound shapes and, and, and things like that. Um, yeah, okay, good. No? <laughs> something artificial and created and actually um, I think in translation it was also very very important. It's not about playing, mm -hmm. it's about listening to language and what language actually is telling you and language is conducting you and uh, language is actually more uh, powerful than you. Mm -hmm. So it's not like you are playing with some sort of, uh, so that you are not constructing, mm -hmm. you are listening. And um, discovering yeah. certain things. Yeah. Yeah. It's associations um, that come, that the language imposes on your. Yeah, I think opposition. it's a principal thing because game has a sort of, you know, a test of something uh, which is not necessary, yeah. mm -hmm. or which is like uh, okay. coming from my will, uh, but it's not about me. Okay. I'm okay. just showing you what is there. Yeah, thank you. Very modest. <laughs> <laughs> so um, uh, yeah, I, I just picked out this uh, yeah. this, this uh, little sentence here. If you could just quickly read it in German. Actually, it's very very questionable if it's um, <laughs> yeah yeah uh, because you know uh, I am not uh, a Jewish scholar and I grew up without all these uh, languages and I didn't know Yiddish, I didn't know Hebrew. Uh, so all these things I'm doing, uh, they are out of this uh, so, um, uh, so even this one, it's a very, very uh, uh, approximate thing. Mm -hmm. So this kind of Polanya, so mm -hmm. there is a concept. Uh, so the point is, should I read in German? Or in German, uh, yes. Polen, Polin, Polonia, Polanya, Polanya. Here won't go the water. Die aus dem slawischen Polen ein gelobtes Land der Juden war. Also, das ist tatsächlich, uh, it's one of the uh, um, ex explanations why, uh, actually, the, why uh, Jews were so attracted by Poland, because one of not very correct writing of uh, Polish Poland is this PLV. So it doesn't matter. Uh, but uh, so uh, this words uh, and of course God is also the very very question. Mm -hmm. There is this concept, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and, uh, but it's a good example of what you said, is where the language leads you. It's, yeah. Even yeah. false etymology is quite relevant. Right? Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> and it didn't pose a problem at all for translation. Yeah. <clears throat> um, you know, I, I didn't actually uh, verify that um, those, <laughs> those, those roots mean those things. But, but I think yeah. possibly Kaja didn't fully either, because that wasn't really the point. Um, mm -hmm. it, was, it, it became reality mm -hmm. because it was so often. But you were led from one language to another in order to discover new things. So, you know, that's, that's, that's the important thing. Okay, there are other instances where I think it was a little bit more difficult. So, there's the um, uh, discussion of a Familienbaum, which is not really, it's, it's, it's a neologism in, in, in German. It's a new I didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> 
and, and have you used familial baum rather than stammbaum to denote family tree? Now stammbaum, uh, you know, is, 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 so stamm is the stem, the uh, trunk, and it's very, very much sort of, you know, mono, I don't know, it has a, you know, a mono root, it's, it's, it's standing there, um, whereas familial baum is much more much more open, you know, referring to a group of people, not this rootedness. And in fact, in Katya's text, um, they are not rooted. You know, the Familienbaum is standing there and people sort of flying and get tangled in it. It's a completely different concept. I would suggest that there's an, another difference. Um, Stammbaum uh, evokes um, sort of you belong and you don't. Um, there's the whole Stammbaum idea of uh, insiders and others. And, um, and Stammbaum is honestly a kind of creepy word. Um, and, and I think, I'm assuming that Katya used familiar well to sidestep that. You know, all of the, the sort of baggage that goes along with Stammbaum. <laughs> It's so interesting, you know, you just make mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> and afterwards, they are concepts of <laughs> Unbelievable things. So I think it was just a mistake of Russian speaker. But the point is that actually, uh, if you're uh, telling me that <coughs> somehow on a certain level, I really understood that, unfortunately, I'm writing a book on my family. Uh, I didn't know that I end, with this, end up with this idea. But uh, I was thinking about all kinds of families, you know, so it was not only the idea that family is something uh, connected to blood. Uh, I'm from a family of teachers uh, uh, which are connected to all these pupils and seven generations, as my mother said, uh, were uh, uh, only actually uh, orphanages. Uh, so there are families and orphans, so orphans belong to us, and uh, my parents are typical, uh, 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 <laughs> this uh, Soviet intelligentsia, it means that cult of friendship is just uh, mm -hmm. the first thing, uh, a normal thing, so it's another family. Uh, there is this uh, beautiful ex Soviet expression, uh, the Elanger and uh, to it, you know this actually uh, pact of Ribbentrop law that was called the enlargement of uh, family of brothers. расширение семьи братских. So enlargement of the family of brother republics. Mm -hmm. So that was the official Soviet name for uh, uh, Pact of Ribbentrop Law. It means that uh, uh, conquering a phone uh, 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 was also this kind of family. Mm -hmm. So so to say, uh, bringing uh, uh, bad relatives back to the family. Uh, so there were many, many things why I needed it. And actually, in the English translation, um, there is also this family tree as a Christmas tree. Mm -hmm. And this is uh, also uh, the point where it was, I think, very difficult to translate because in German it's Tannenbaum uh, and in the English it's Christmas tree. And actually in Russian it was just Yolka. So it's really just the name of the tree. So there is no connotation mm -hmm. to Christmas. Mm -hmm. in, in our neighborhood, so this kind of appropriation of, uh, and it was a Stalin idea to, you know, Christmas was prohibited in the Soviet Union, and Stalin uh, in '35 decided to that uh, before the big country, he had to to install uh, everyday life uh, and uh, some uh, beautiful uh, celebrations. So it's how Christmas was put back but uh, without this Christmas connotation. So actually, the whole Soviet Union celebrated Christmas without knowing that it was Christmas, it was New Year Eve, so we had this Yolka, uh, Talibbaum, a Christmas tree, on the, 30th, uh, uh, on the 31st of December. So, mm -hmm. okay.
or yeah. more yeah. physical. <laughs> You're yeah. translating it as, as, as Christmas tree. So the kind of tradition is the same, but it's very different. I mean, no matter how you render it, um, you have lingering worries mm -hmm. about it not conveying the same, mm -hmm. um, what they say, mm -hmm. called word field um, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and range of associations. Mm -hmm. It never will. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. But then it's so. There's a new line, though. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think we we can just uh, do this more quickly. Uh, <laughs> oh yes. Oh my. <laughs> <laughs> so this was about um, one of your family names being down. Yeah. Oh. Um, yes. This is one of the thorniest yeah. moments. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Um, because in German, um, the word Stern carries both meanings, the proper name and the, uh, the common noun, and um, I couldn't possibly capture that uh, in one word. So I tried to, um, I caught it in a roundabout, sort of, I can't read all of it because that water bottle was in the oh. <laughs> <laughs> but, Okay, now I know. Was um, but, but maybe that's one of those linguistic blocks that in itself <laughs> You know, we're always sort of blocked off from full meaning and um, <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't need to be um, only in our minds. <laughs> Here's another one that I love. Um, oh, that's, 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 oh, that's really, that's exactly the, that's exactly the point, you know. Uh, I mean, uh, um, about uh, lost in translations, yeah. Actually, Vergehaut, Vergehaut dazu. I was really strong with this German uh, thing. It means I'm uh, telling the story about my family, about the teachers of uh, deaf mute kids. And uh, I didn't know anything about that, so I was uh, reading books on Jewishness uh, and the uh, concept of uh, deaf and mute in Jewish communities in the 19th century, in the 18th century. Uh, why they taught uh, kids actually spoken language, not sign language, and all these concepts. And actually, uh, it turns out that the most important is to be heard. So, Shmei uh, Israel, uh, the, uh, uh, actually, it's in all languages. Uh, that uh, you are addressing God uh, and asking Him to, to, to listen to you. And in this mere uh, 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 simple act of addressing, of speaking to God, you already accepted this. So, it's just unbelievable that uh, German language carries this meaning. Mm -hmm. So, it's not me who, who mm -hmm. is creating. I was really. What? <laughs> yeah. So, therefore, I am protesting against this. Uh, uh, it's not working. Play uh, 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 games. Yeah. It's not. It's like you're exploring. You're you're exploring some sort of religious concept, and it's just in the language and only German. Mm -hmm. So I'm sorry. Uh, I was really like like envious. Uh, to be heard is to belong. So it's a bit an unjust translation. But I I have to uh, admit that thinking in Russian, writing in German. I, I lost many things exactly in this um, in this perspective. For example, uh, uh, just just one example. Uh, the first chapter in the book is uh, about uh, um, uh, departing from a Berlin railway station, and you know, in Russian, railway station is Vokzal. Do you know where it's mm -hmm. coming from? From Warsaw. So, yeah. Yes, it's the Russian word for railway station, Vakzal. But, but there is, of course, the second false etymologization uh, of this word is Vox and Zal. And it's coming in Russian poetry all the time. The, the voices in the poem. One of the most important verses of uh, Josef Mandelstam, concert in the Vauxhall. So a concert in the Vauxhall. Actually, on the railway station. Mm -hmm. And actually, it's uh, tautological. Mm -hmm. So, and only 
when I finished this, when, when I was talking to uh, translators, suddenly I realized that uh, my uh, railway station in Berlin is full of this crisis, and I'm thinking about this uh, um, poem of Mandelstam and this kind of uh, couple, you know, and these people talking, and this kind of uh, fugue which is taking place in the in the uh, in the uh, in the uh, prologue has something to do with Bogzal, which is railway station, with, which is the, uh, the 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 place for voices. That's it, you know. And it's completely lost in German because it's only in Russian, and it it creates a sort of motif in in the book which is not uh, seen. So, but you decided not so to transcribe. <laughs> You decided not to transcribe the Russians in order to somehow. No, no, no. But it's it's also uh, Shelley knows better even than I uh, that uh, there are many things in the book or, uh, uh, where I'm explaining words. For example, I'm explaining that my name Petrovska is coming from Piotr and it's uh, Stein and it's stone. So sometimes I'm explaining exactly like uh, so uh, like Shelley chose to explain stern like in mm -hmm. in one sentence uh, to show the similar words, um, but sometimes it's too much. Mm -hmm. So you can, uh, so I was moving in between this uh, thinking in different languages and explaining and. Uh, uh, so, but, but proportion is very, very important thing, and uh, it has to be chosen uh, in your case. But it's hard, it's a loss. <laughs> it's, it's, it must have been hard to... It's, yeah. it's a move. It's a, it's yeah. a move. Yeah. Um, I mean, this is this part and parcel of all translation. Yeah. As you move from yes. one language to the other, um, you know, how can you make most elements mm -hmm. of what's important in a given word, sentence, pa uh, passage, um, do the most work, you know, mm -hmm. how do you get the biggest bang for your buck, as we say. Mm -hmm. um, and um, sometimes it's by expanding uh, somewhat. Um, uh, in English we sometimes call things like that first sentence of um, a stuff gloss, um, that you sneak in a couple of words to tip your hat. Um, you know, what is actually going on here? Um, and, um, and, and as a result, English is thought to be, not by me, but by others, uh, to be a short language as compared to German. Um, but uh, in other words, so, uh, fewer words. Well, there are many ways in which that's not true. For one thing, one German word <laughs> can turn into many in English. But, but also, uh, translations from any language into any other, including mine from German into English, um, need to... Um, elucidate in some way to orient a new readership to things that might be intuitively obvious to the, um, to the home readership. Um, and so we have to swell things a little bit. I'm aware of time um, moving on. And I was wondering, we have another longer passage. Do you still have the stomach for that? Or, um Shall we do leave. that? Yeah. <laughs> let, let, let's do that now. I mean, there's, there's lots more, but yeah, let's we'll, let's we'll come back from three to two, so you can you can bear with two, right? Yeah. Um, okay. I I can try to be short. I'm big. Um, okay. Uh, just um, talk. I know. Uh, so um, it's from the passage uh, about. Um, uh, about my great grandmother who was shot in Kiev uh, during the massacre in Babi Yar, but she didn't manage to uh, to go there. She was left in Kiev uh, when the whole family uh, was evacuated, and she was too old to uh, to be taken uh, with the family. And it's a small uh, passage uh, in, in inside uh, her going towards her death. So in a way, it's a sort of uh, uh, lyrical, how to say, meditation. Yes, uh, it's exactly what happened afterwards. I understood that actually uh, it's how Homer described the show. Uh, um, 
uh, before the Achilles was killed. Uh, uh, so, so it's it's like trying to slow down uh, this kind of uh, talking. And uh, it's a story about Ficus. My father told me where we have to start. Um, um, others in the past. Okay, I have it. Um, okay, uh, so um, that's a story uh, my father told me about uh, his uh, uh, vocation. So he was uh, saved. He moved from here, um, and he told me that uh, uh, his father um, um, he was evacuated in a track uh, where at first uh, big uh, uh, fighters actually in German Ficus uh, uh, was was that lucky for me. <laughs> what? Lucky for me that the words are so similar. <laughs> yes, yes. That's a gift. Exactly, but but in German uh, actually it's written in, uh, uh, with C U uh, like like in Latin and like in in in, in, uh, uh, in English. And so I really insisted to put car a K uh, as in a bad uh, um, badly written uh, Shells in in uh, in uh, flower stores mm -hmm. uh, because in Germany it's, uh, you know, so it's with a car and it's not um, it's not correct in Germany uh, just because fiktion uh, is with car you know mm -hmm. and just because I'm Russian and I never distinguish C and K so because it's uh, like mm -hmm. and uh, <laughs> that's it um, and therefore maybe I have to oh, okay anyway I'm using in German so. Uh, the point is that uh, my father forgot uh, the speakers. He told me that he was saved just because of the speakers, and in a certain point he forgot uh, the story he told me. The Stammes Bruder, dieses Jungen, die in der Stadt geblieben waren, obwohl Stammes Bruder ist ein neutraler Begriff. Lassen Sie uns Juden sagen, es ist einfacher, einfacher in dem Sinne, dass man es besser versteht, als ob man es besser verstehen könnte. Aber es ist leider oder fatale Weise wirklich verständlich, ja, Postfaktum natürlich, erst Postfaktum, weil man weiß, was danach passiert ist, aber wirklich gerechtfertigt ist das, was passiert ist, das mich trotzdem nicht. Also die, die geblieben waren, wurden in Magia zusammengetrieben, ohne wie meine Mutter zu schreiben und lebt in BJ. Also alle wüssten, was BJ bedeutet, oder als ob sie diesen Ort wirklich und ich meine wirklich, nicht bei vollen Namen nennen könnte. Und dort wurden sie erschossen. Aber das wissen sie bestimmt. Hier ist und hier genauso weit entfernt wie Paris. Und jetzt weiß ich, wozu ich meinen Titus brauche. Papa, du hast den Titus vergessen. Welchen Titus? Ich erinnere mich an keinen Titus. Hofe, Bündel, Säcke, Kisten, aber ein Titus? Papa, aber du hast mir doch von dem Titus erzählt, der vom Lastwagen wieder heruntergenommen wurde. Was für ein Fikus, ich erinnere mich nicht daran, vielleicht habe ich das vergessen. Ich war auf den Fikus fixiert, ich war fixiert. Ich verstand nicht, wie man so etwas vergessen kann. Ich verstand nicht, was jemand das Menschen erschüttert. Was jemandem passiert sein musste, um so etwas zu vergessen. Der Fikus scheint mir die Hauptfigur, ja, wenn nicht der Weltgeschichte, dann meine Familiengeschichte zu sein. In meiner Fassung hat der Fikus das Leben meines Vaters gerettet. Doch wenn selbst mein, mein Vater sich nicht mehr an den Fikus erinnern kann, dann hat es ihn vielleicht tatsächlich nicht gegeben. Als er mir vor der Evakuierung erzählt hat, habe ich in meinem Bild möglicherweise die fehlenden Details in die Lücken, in die Lücken des Straßenraums eingeführt. Gab es ein Fikus oder ist da eine Fiktion? Wurde die Fiktion aus dem Fikus geboren oder umgekehrt? Vielleicht werde ich nie feststellen, ob der Fikus, der mein Vater gerettet hat, überhaupt irgendwann existiert. Ich rufe meinen Vater an und er tröstet mich. Sogar wenn er nicht existiert hat, sagen solche Fehlleistungen manchmal mehr aus, als eine penibel gefüllte Bestandsaufnahme. Manchmal ist es gerade die Prise Dichtung, welche die Erinnerung wahrheitsgetreu macht. So wurde mein fiktiver Fikus als literarischer Gegenstand äh, 
Noch keine Woche war vergangen, als mein Vater zu mir sagte, ich glaube, ich erinnere mich an einen Fikus. Vielleicht. Oder habe ich den Fikus jetzt von dir? Weil mein Großvater, ich glaube, wir wollten uns das Ich denke, ja, because the English is already lost. Ah, okay, weil eigentlich... Das ganze, das ganze, das ganze endet, dass das, äh, es hat sich also herausgestellt, äh, dass das, äh, ja, okay. Ja, man muss natürlich das. Das wird so Fiktion. So this Fikus and fiction and focus and, and, and whatever was was great fun and um, and actually in an earlier draft of um, I was fixated on that ficus I was ficusated um, I had I was focused on that ficus, you might say I was ficused. And so um, there were many options for yeah. it because English lent itself perfectly to capturing that. Um, it was actually um, surprisingly easy to, um, to cope with that. Do you have the German, uh, do you want to put the German up? And um, the English? I'm wondering about the terms of time. We should just open up to questions. Everything. It's otherwise, people have things where it is, so I think. Could we still see the German on the street? Oh, absolutely, right, yes, yes, we can do that. Oh, no. So, what time do we Well, in that case, let's do it. Come on, let's do it. Yeah? Yeah. Okay, I'll speed read. Speed read. Oh, that's English, right. Others of the boys' tribe, those who had remained in the city, although others of the tribe is so neutral, let's say Jews. It's easier, easier in the sense that it's better understood, as though it could be understood better, but it is, unfortunately or devastatingly, truly easier to understand after the fact, of course, only after the fact, once you know what happened afterward, but that doesn't actually justify what happened anyway. So, those who had remained in the city were rounded up in Babiar, or as my mother always writes, B-Y, as though everyone knows what B-Y means, as though she really, and I mean really, couldn't call this place by its full name. And they were shot to death there, but you surely know that. Kiev is just as far from here as Paris. And now, what I, now I know what I need my ficus for. Papa, you forgot the ficus. What ficus? I don't remember any ficus. Suitcases, bundles, crates, uh, bags, crates, but a ficus? Papa, you did tell me about the ficus that was taken back down from the truck. Which ficus? I don't recall that. Maybe I forgot. I was fixated on that ficus. I was ficusated. I didn't understand how something like that could be forgotten. I didn't understand what must have happened to forget something like that. The ficus strikes me as the main character of the history, if not of the world, then of my family. In my version, the ficus saved my father's life. But if even my father can no longer remember the ficus, maybe it didn't really exist. Keep in mind the title of the book, Maybe Esther. There's a lot of maybe-ness going on here. Sorry to interrupt. Um, when he told me about the evacuation, maybe I inserted the missing details into the blanks of the street. Did the ficus exist, or was it a fiction? Was the fiction born from the ficus or the other way around? I may never find out whether the ficus that saved my father ever existed at all. I call up my father, and he comforts me. Even if he didn't exist, these kinds of mistakes sometimes tell us more than painstaking inventory. Sometimes that pinch of poetry is the very thing that makes memory truth. And so my fictive ficus was vindicated as a literary subject. <laughs> Um, I was struck by the fact that at the beginning, Calcio, you said that, and quite rightly, obviously, that you, you have to say to the English publisher, this is not a memoir. And I find myself that publishers, they always want to pigeonhole the book into a certain genre. And often, some of the best books cannot be pigeonholed. Um, and I just wondered whether that you'd had any difficulty in getting an English language publisher to, to pick the book up. Or was it picked up quite easily? Uh, do you know how it was picked up? 
there is a big publishing house, uh, Sulkamp, and they were selling rights. Yes, so the, the publisher, publisher to publisher. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We usually have very little sense yeah. of how yeah. the transactions yeah. happen. No, it was interesting because I've, I've been uh, recently looking for a publisher for um, Leben in Zwei Welten by Rosa Berenfeld. And I've been fortunate because the academics who put together the book, the German academics, paid my time for me to look for a publisher for them. So, it, but I had to go through 2025 until we thought we'd found one. And it was because of this business of pigeonholing. You know, it's not a biography, it's not an autobiography, it's not a memoir. But, uh, well, in terms of pigeonholing, um, it's not just by the label that you attach to the um, to the genre, as it were, yeah. but also the cover. I just like to show you yeah. um, the original uh, paperback German cover. Um, I'd like to show you uh, the hardback <coughs> that's also here, um, which gives, evokes a very different sense already, mm -hmm. um, because publishers have this ability. Here is the um, British uh, paperback, and here is the American both hardback and paperback. Mm -hmm. um, they convey very different feelings. Mm -hmm. Have you seen this at all? <laughs> um, and um, and so, uh, in fact, you uh, you almost see Stadtland mm -hmm. here. Um, and and these, uh, in addition to whatever label you may give it for. Library of Congress numbers and, um, and, uh, and shelving and bookstores. Um, the cover tells you, um, speaks volumes yeah. about what's in it. And, uh, and we have typically little to no control yeah. over that. We also have, and this is not very well known, uh, we translators. And I don't know if this is also true of authors, but we have very little control over the titles of our books. Um, I, I translated a book recently that's coming out with a vastly different subtitle. Um, I won't get into that, um, but it, um, it, it, it presupposes a different market from the one I would have expected. Um, yeah, with maybe us or no. I mean, uh, uh, because I, I, I was fighting for Vielleicht ist er as crazy. Mm -hmm. yeah. you know? Really, because uh, uh, all ten uh, like, I don't know, editors didn't want this title. Um, yeah, I would like to hear a little bit more about the uh, problem or the relationship between you and the editor. We had that question earlier on today. And so uh, it would be interesting how, how that happened. Or was there any uh, intervention of the editor, or how did you? Um, submit your manuscript. Did you have already somebody else who went with you over the German, or was it? Right. Um, so, to, what is the degree that there is somebody else intervening, smoothing out your German to, uh, yeah, to make it? Uh, to, uh, to like to with me. <laughs> <laughs> You're pouring salt on a wood there. No, no, no. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I met like. 17 years ago on the playground, uh, an incredible woman who forced me to write in German, and she was uh, 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 she was from Switzerland and uh, worked for Monitor Zeitung. Uh, she lived for so many years in, in the States. So actually, it's a sort of uh, uh, a Russian uh, uh, Swedish book. <laughs> Because we rewrite each text like 100 times, uh, maybe 60. Mm -hmm. um, so it means that uh, my German is not that good. Uh, it means that uh, I'm, uh, I'm writing without articles, and then she puts articles, and then the rhythm is completely different, and then you have to rewrite to gain the rhythm, and then she corrects words, and uh, it's again three syllables and not uh, four. Uh, or vice versa, so I have to get this rhythm. So it was quite, or I, I was making some things and uh, she told me it's not convincing. So I had to leave some of them and to, uh, to put some of them in a more convincing way, which is not. So uh, it would have been completely different without her, of course. And uh, she believed me because I'm not that associated. She just forced me to go on, and uh, 
and actually the whole idea from the beginning uh, um, it was I just wrote a few essays in German in my life and then uh, I wrote a text on uh, Soviet childhood and uh, it was for Sukup, uh, for this big publishing house and uh, one of the most amazing uh, editors from this publishing house who actually brought almost 800 books uh, from East European space into the uh, Sukup and she is also partly uh, um, guilty for the fame of uh, Hungarian literature in Germany um, so on, so she just asked me what I'm actually doing, and I said that uh, I'm thinking about this, this, and this, uh, like seven projects. And she said, just start with this one, and it was about my family. And I said, I already, I have already started. And uh, she told me, just show me 50 pages, and we will see. And I mean, till that time, I had just uh, maybe 10 texts in uh, Egypt. And, uh, but I started to write a column in Frankfurt Allgemeine and Sonntagszeitung, which was also very funny story because there, is no, no, there are no people who get columns after 10 texts. Yeah. So, uh, but it was my favorite job. Um, it was a satirical column. <laughs> and, uh, more or less. <laughs> and uh, so it's hard to explain. And, uh, um, uh, there are people like that, like these editors, they just believe in you and, uh, okay, it started completely without money, that's another side of the story. Mm -hmm. uh, because I experienced in this Bachman Prize that, uh, during this Bachman Prize, that people who were standing next to me and actually promoting their books, which were already written and but not published, uh, they had incredible amount of money mm -hmm. just to write book. This book and, uh, but anyway, I mean, so come uh, who's writing the uh, first down. So that's about the story. Yeah. Yeah, I want to ask a sort of similar question about the translation process. Um, and you have a different relationship with translators whose language you do speak, like yeah. UK Spanish, yeah. or other languages that you don't speak, it could be translated into saying. Yeah, of course, uh, of course it's very different and I think it's not uh, easy to translate, uh, uh, to translate uh, books of uh, authors who are still alive and <laughs> that know your language, so and it's really hard and in my case language was really more important than the topic, if I, if I, if I may say that, so, but there are still many different perspectives how to translate and if you on the end accept the concept or trust or whatever, it's still a lot of uh, effort, uh, uh, but uh, it was not easy for me and maybe it was the first language uh, which I more or less knew, you know, of course not to a certain uh, that extent. So it was not, uh, it wasn't easy, of course it wasn't easy, but I like it very much now. I mean, I was, I think I was panicking. I was incredibly thinking. Uh, there was a certain point when I was so depressed and, uh, and yeah, and sort of, you know, like you're losing sort of uh, uh, a very authentic state. And uh, so it was much easier to, to work with Dutch and Hungarian people. Uh, because you cannot control, so you can talk about certain things, agree about certain things, uh, and and uh, in English you think, no, no, it's not this word, because I don't know this word, so I cannot use this word. So this was, it was really a little bit too much, I think, control. And you were born in Ukraine, and, you know, you I was born in Soviet Union. Yes, you were born in Soviet Union. But you were born in Kiev. Yes. Where, I mean, well, I don't know, but in contemporary Ukraine, there are two languages spoken. So I don't know whether you have any experience of Ukrainian and uh, whether, you know, what is your uh, sort of relationship to what has happened since in, in Ukraine? Also, have you been translated into Russian? Uh, and uh, just another last question. What is your answer to the question before last? Uh, if this woman, your editor, 
as you described her, it seems as if she has a big stake uh, in this book and in the text of the book. I wonder whether uh, a co-authorship was ever maybe discussed or co-authorship. No. So, so she was not, uh, I mean, uh, I was talking about the writing process with many friends and uh, she was actually correcting grammar. And uh, she was suggesting some stylistic things as a normal editor. But there was another one, uh, another editor who actually was above all of us uh, from Soka. And uh, she also suggested a few things. But I was fighting with her. I mean, it was really not funny. I mean, uh, uh, so there were other things I was thinking afterwards, after the success, uh, how to face her because she was uh, doing uh, everything for me without money all this time because I didn't have money I mean, at all. So uh, actually, this uh, this book is a, is a result of an employment. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's it. So Ukraine and Russia. I grew up in the, uh, in the Russian city. You know, it's like. Very mixed because uh, there is a new generation in Kiev speaking Ukrainian. Uh, people who didn't move from Kiev are truly bilingual uh, of my age. <coughs> All my friends are bilingual. But I moved when I was 16, so I'm like, uh, you know, there was a joke about uh, uh, nationalists and internationalists in, in Soviet Union. So, uh, national, nationalists in Soviet Union speak two languages and internationalists speak one. <laughs> so I can't. So uh, I'm more like um, the second one. Uh, uh, and it's really funny because I moved to Moscow and then I moved to Estonia. And when I was back, all my friends uh, spoke two languages freely. And, uh, so I'm like a relic of, relic of Soviet era. Um, uh, and sometimes it's not funny. Um, but when I'm writing in Russian, actually this Ukrainian substrat is very important, incredibly important, because there is no reduction of vowels in Ukrainian. Uh, it's more like single language. Of course, everybody would tell me it's a colonial approach, you know. <laughs> Uh, because, you know, uh, it's funnier, it's more lyric, it's, you know, all these things, you know, like usual things. Um, uh, yeah, maybe it's a colonial approach, but it's still true. <laughs> uh, uh, because it's really also uh, lyric. Uh, it has a sudden touch. Uh, and uh, so when I'm writing in, in, in Russian, there are some local things. And, it's actually it's a very interesting topic, this kind of uh, Russian-Ukrainian, it's not Russian-Ukrainian, but this kind of writing in Russian, knowing obviously like languages from childhood. It's very different, and I mean, one don't need to know Gogol uh, or things like that, but, but it's really obvious. Thank you. I think we have probably exhausted to you <laughs> but um, I would like to thank you again. It was absolutely wonderful. Thank you.